politicians today are, are challenging the democratic norms. The norm, trust in, the, in, in democratic procedure, has been weakened. The willingness of many voters to just say, I accept the election outcome, has been weakened somewhat. We all know the 2020 election was tumultuous, but what does this mean for the state of democracy? I was able to um, campaign. I was a canvasser in Arizona. So I actually moved out to Phoenix, Maricopa County, where we were able to put on the largest campaign in Arizona history. I personally knocked over 4,500 doors this past election. And I think people are just very ill-informed on the entire process and just they really do go based off like the media. This country is very decentralized in its voting system. The states run the elections. The states all have different rules and they get to make them up. Each state gets a number of, of electoral votes and then those electorals all go vote in what's called the electoral college and that cannot be changed. It's in the constitution. What can be changed is how those electors are selected. So the states can decide how they want to choose their electors for the electoral college but they can't choose how many they have. According to the Constitution, states technically don't even need to have a popular presidential election. However, most states have passed winner-take-all laws, meaning that the candidate who wins the popular vote in a state gets all of that state's electoral votes. As you probably know, there's an unfairness in the Electoral College. You know, the small states are, are overrepresented compared to the large states. According to 2016 statistics, about 18.2 million people were registered to vote in California, while about 240,000 were registered to vote in Wyoming. California gets 55 electoral votes, while Wyoming gets three. So one electoral vote in California represents 330,000 people, while one in Wyoming represents 80,000. To change that, you'd have to change the Constitution with a constitutional amendment. That takes three quarters of the states. So there's no chance that all those little states are going to vote to give up their advantage. This disproportion is the reason a candidate could win the popular vote but lose the overall election. A bill titled National Popular Vote Interstate Compact would require states to give all of their electoral votes to whoever wins the popular vote nationwide instead of whoever wins their state. For this law to be enacted, enough states to represent a total of 270 electoral votes would need to agree to it. However, the presidential election isn't just about the president. More than often, people told me, like, I honestly just thought that it was just going to be like the president on the ballot. They don't realize that there's these a bunch of other things on the ballot. Propositions are written by policymakers for policymakers. And unless you have some type of education or anything, realistically, they kind of, when you read them, the yes or no, sometimes they sound the same. For me, what I would do is find organizations that I felt like their values aligned with mine, such as the ACLU, and I made a lot of my voting decisions based off these organizations. One of the major topics of discussion this past election was voter fraud. What does the term mean and how can we evaluate it? The, the term basically just means votes that are cast that shouldn't be, but that can happen in a bunch of ways. I think the main concerns are, are twofold. One is its effect on elections, and it could be enough to make people feel like there's something that's not right about the elections and drive down trust in, in, in election results. As academics, what we do is look at existing data, try to go back and find, you know, what, what data would be most relevant to this question and, uh, and try to learn something from that data. We always consistently across all of these studies find incredibly low levels of fraud. For example, in the case of double voting, we take, we take like a social security number, which is actually unique for individuals. And we say how many people with the same social security number, same name, same birth date voted in two states. And it turns out very, very few, even if you can't go get really solid information today about the rates of fraud in your county in 2020, uh, we can have pretty confident beliefs about what happened because we've seen over and over again in, pre in studies from previous years that even when this was alleged, it was quite uncommon. Because of the large scale of US elections, it might be easy to feel like your voice is lost in the crowd. So what I tell people when they tell me like, I'm not going to vote because my vote doesn't matter. I tell them there's many other things on the ballot that directly impact you. Your city council member that, you know, they make decisions for the neighborhood that you live in, the propositions. There's so many other things on the ballot. I do this because I have people in my life who I care about who 
don't have a voice in this country. They're undocumented. They've lived here their whole life. You're not just voting for yourself. You're voting on behalf of millions of people like my family who don't have a voice in this country. So your vote matters. Attitudes toward democracy are constantly changing, but we can rely on data and structure to ensure that our voices are being heard. If you live in California, the next chance to vote will be on June 7th, 2022. This election will determine various positions statewide.